Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's about quarter past, so let me uh, ask you all to take your seats and we'll get started. And I'm sure there'll be a few people uh, trickling in. It's really a pleasure to uh, be hosting this event. My name is Andrew Gordon, and I'm the acting director of the Harvard Yenching Institute this year, which is a, a job that I've really enjoyed greatly. And one of the highlights is indeed today. The Harvard Yenching Institute has a mission for the promoting of higher education in Asia. We principally do it through bringing visiting scholars and visiting graduate students, PhD candidates to campus, but we do a number of other things. And one thing that we've been doing since 2010, so this is the 10th year, is every year uh, sponsoring the Asian Association for Asian Studies in an invitation to an eminent intellectual from Asia, from the area represented by the president of the AAS in that year to give a keynote speech at the AAS meeting. And so one of our speakers today, Dr. Tom Mian U, was that person this year and gave a marvelous keynote address uh, this past Thursday in Denver that I was fortunate to hear uh, talking about contemporary Myanmar and the dilemmas it's facing. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a speech filled with optimism, but with realism, and it was, it was really an important occasion, and there was, it was a great audience. We've also been inviting every time we can, most every one of these, uh, this is the 10th year we've been doing this, uh, years, the keynoter to come to Cambridge, either before or after that event, and take part in a roundtable discussion, uh, as much as possible framed around a different issue than the one that the keynote speaker presents at the AAS, so that those of you who went to both will learn something different. And that's indeed the case this year. So we're very grateful to uh, Dr. Todd for coming to Cambridge to do uh, this panel. And we've we discussed among ourselves what might be a good topic. And I want to thank, I don't think he's here, but my colleague Sunil Amrith in um, the Department of History and the Department of South Asian Studies uh, noted that um, in addition to his work and writing on contemporary Myanmar and its history, uh, Dr. Tam Min U has also played a very important role in the preservation of architectural heritage in his country uh, and a founder indeed of uh, an organization called the Yangon Heritage Trust, which takes that as his mission. And that may led us to think that having a discussion of efforts to preserve colonial architecture around Asia would be an interesting one. And it was wonderful to be able to quickly get yes um, replies from three other really distinguished scholars of the history of architecture and of architectural preservation uh, efforts elsewhere in Asia. And so today's um, event will start with brief presentations uh, from each panelist and then some discussion among the panel of their presentations. We haven't asked the, you to present formal papers, so each has not read in detail the other's work, but we did have some discussion over lunch, so hopefully it won't come as a total shock what each of you is saying, <laughs> and then respond to each other. And then the last uh, 30 minutes or so, we will have a chance for those of you in the audience to ask questions and join the discussion, followed by a reception outside. I should also say that there are several co-sponsors of today's event. I want to thank them all, the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, the Harvard University Asia Center, the Korea Institute, and the Lakshmi Mittal and Family uh, South Asia Institute. So thanks to all of our co-sponsors. Let me briefly introduce, or medium briefly, because they've got many important achievements, our uh, speakers in the order in which they'll speak, and then I'll turn it over to them. Dr. Tant Min U is a writer, a historian, a conservationist. He's also formerly the advisor to the president of Myanmar. His education was both here at Harvard and in the other Cambridge, uh, Cambridge University, where he taught history from 1996 to 2000 uh, as a fellow of Trinity College. He's written three books. The most recent, which I've read and really strongly recommend, is Where China Meets India, colon, Burma and the New Crossroads of Asia. 
And as I mentioned, he's the founder and chairman of the Yangon Heritage Trust. He's also been active in many other governmental advisory uh, and international body uh, activities. Uh, the founder and chairman of Utant House, uh, a member of the um, National Economic and Social Advisory Council of Myanmar from 2011 to 15, an advisor to the Myanmar government for the peace process of those same years, and a former senior advisor to the Myanmar uh, Beyond Ceasefires Initiative. He's also served on three United Nations peacekeeping operations in Cambodia, the former Yugoslavia, and the UN Secretariat in New York. And he worked there also at the UN as Chief of Policy Planning in the Department of Political Affairs. He was the principal officer responsible for the establishment of the Secretary General's high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change in 2003 and involved in negotiations towards the 2005 World Summit and establishing a UN Peace Building Commission. He currently lives in Yangon and is working on a new book about Myanmar, covering the, basically the 21st century, 2003 to 18. So he will speak first. Our next speaker will be Professor Fu Chaoqing, who is a distinguished uh, architect and architectural his historian of architecture. He did his undergraduate work in architecture in Taiwan at the National Cheng Kung University, then a master's degree in architecture at the University of Washington in Seattle, followed by a PhD from the University of Edinburgh. He's a leading architectural historian in Taiwan and an expert on heritage conservation in Taiwan. He's taught at the Department of Architecture at the National Cheng Kung University since 1983, and he's lectured widely in Taiwan and around the world. He's been involved as committee member on a number of municipal and central government governments, with the central government and number of municipal governments in Taiwan, and has published literally hundreds of research papers and books since 1983. <coughs> he was awarded the Fellowship of the Architecture Institute of Taiwan in 2013, and is now Professor Emeritus since his retirement in 2017. Our next speaker will be uh, Professor Liu Chen. Uh, Professor Liu teaches at Tsinghua University, where she received her Bachelor of Architecture in 2000, and then a Master's in Architecture and Urban Planning from, Harvard, from University of Maryland. And then she practiced for a while in Washington, D.C. as an architect until 2005. She then went back to school, received a PhD in Art History from Princeton in 2011. Her specialty in that PhD was not Asia, but was Europe, working, looking at Renaissance and Baroque art and architecture. I should say that uh, Professor Liu is um, this year a visiting scholar of the Harvard Genting Institute, and it's been a pleasure to get to know her in that capacity as well. Um, she teaches visual arts at Beijing Film Academy and graduate courses in Shanghai at Tongji University and she has published uh, several scholarly articles on uh, early modern art and architecture, as well as the response of Chinese scholars to the Italian Renaissance. And she's a public figure as well, writing regular columns on art history, on art history and books for various major magazines in China. And by the way, I have to ask you all to silence these devices. Um, mine just rang, but I'll... <coughs> Fortunately, it's on silent mode, so <laughs> they won't bother you. <coughs> Our final uh, speaker will be Professor Kim hyun Sub, who is a professor in the Department of Architecture at Korea University. He also was a visiting scholar of the Harvard Yenching Institute in 2014 to 15. So it's, it's really a pleasure to have one current and one former visiting scholar on our panelists. He studied architecture at Korea University and the University of Sheffield in the UK. He was appointed to Korea <coughs> University as a professor in 2008, and he's been teaching architectural history, theory, and criticism there. And he's now focused on writing a critical history of modern architecture in Korea. His recent publications include Architecture Class, History of Western Modern Architecture, that was in 2016, and he's also translated into Korean a book by Jonathan Hale, Building Ideas, an Introduction to Architecture Theory, Architectural Theory. 
and, and several other articles as well. So it's a pleasure to welcome you all here, and I look forward to hearing what you say and then to the discussion to follow. So, Thank you very much for the, for the introduction. It's, uh, it's a great uh, honor for me to be here. Very grateful to the Enching Institute for inviting me and, 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 and um, making it possible for me to go to the AAS conference as, as well. Um, and it's great for me to be back at Harvard after a long time. I've been back a couple of times since I was an undergraduate here 35 years ago, uh, but it's always, uh, it's always a pleasure. I, I was uh, studied East Asian, my, my major was different. I was a major in government, but I had the, I remember I had the privilege and the, the pleasure of studying um, cultural revolution under Professor McFarquhar when he was first teaching that course in 1985 and also studied uh, intensive Mandarin for, for a year although I've forgotten everything since then. In the, in the, in the 10 minutes to, to sort of help kick off our, our discussion, I'm gonna tell you the story of, of Yangon conservation these past uh, 10 years. It's, a, it's an exciting story, uh, but I'll warn you now, the, the, the ending is, is slightly sad, but we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in terms of what might be possible in the future. As most of you probably know, uh, Yangon or Rangoon was, it was the capital of Burma for a long time. It's a city that was founded by a Burmese king in the 1750s. It was then conquered by the British twice in, in 1825 and in 1853. It then became the capital of British Burma from 1853 until the Japanese invasion of 1942. After independence in 1948, it remained the capital of Burma. Uh, and then in 1962, when the army regime uh, took power and isolated the country, Rangoon was more or less uh, frozen in time, physically. And so even though there was immense social change in those early years of military rule especially, uh, from 1962 until about 1990, the country was, uh, uh, the country to some extent, and, and Rangoon in particular, uh, was frozen in time physically and became an almost time capsule of, of, of pre-war uh, and colonial era uh, uh, Burma and, and Rangoon. Under the British, Rangoon had become a major uh, seaport of the, of the British Empire and quite a cosmopolitan place as well, with actually a majority Indian population, uh, as well as Burmese, Chinese, and European and other minorities uh, as well. And so in 1990, and I remember in, in the 1980s, uh, studying here and then going back home and, and, and spending summers in Rangoon, it was uh, a very, uh, it was a kind of very laid back place, uh, sort of overgrown with crumbling colonial era, but very beautiful uh, colonial era buildings. And then in the 1990s, things began to change. We had a uprising, uh, democracy uprising in 1988. We had Western sanctions, and we had the collapse of Burmese socialism and the beginnings of a kind of a, a type of capitalism which took hold by the early 1990s. And with that new capitalism came uh, the destruction of, of much of Yangon's uh, architectural heritage. Uh, we know now, we didn't know at that time, but we know now that there were about 2,600 pre-war buildings in, in Rangoon in the early 1990s, and about 1,200 of those buildings were destroyed between 1995 and 2010. And I wasn't very much involved. I was in exile part of the time. Uh, I was focused on, on history, on political issues later. In the, late, in the late 2000s, I traveled back to the country to try to engage the, 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 the junta at the time, uh, work on humanitarian aid issues. But I noticed in the late 2000s uh, the extent to which uh, one beautiful uh, 19th or early 20th century building after another was being destroyed, uh, that there was, no uh, there was no conversation at all about any possible uh, protection of these buildings or conservation. And even worse, in a way, was that you know, these buildings were being torn down, and what was being built in their place uh, were, were not attractive buildings at all, and, and were often very cheap uh, buildings that, that would take the place of, of these 100, 150-year-old, um, uh, very memorable uh, structures. And so in, in 2011, I started uh, what I originally thought would just be a kind of a, a one-month initiative, but which took uh, which took the form then of a, of a multi-year sort of campaign to try to save what was left of the, of the old town in, in, in Rangoon. I was in 2011 working very closely with uh, some of the ex-generals who were then pushing for uh, liberal uh, political reforms in the country, uh, working with, for them or with them on foreign policy issues and on the peace process. 
And so I had built up a certain amount of, of political capital with them. And I used that political capital in, in a couple of meetings to, to ask if, if they might also think about saving uh, these old buildings. And many of them just thought I was crazy. They had never thought about this. They had no idea that, that these old buildings could be valuable. Uh, and the, basically, I, I made a pitch to them uh, that, was, that was comprised of, of three different kind of arguments. The first argument, which was kind of the easiest argument to make, or at least the easiest argument I think that they could uh, relate to, was that, you know, sort of, I might be crazy in, in valuing these buildings, but there were a lot of crazy Western tourists who might like these buildings as well. And then at a time when the government was trying to grow the economy and create jobs, that these buildings could be valuable for the economy and for the future tourism and economy. And that was, that was pretty understood by, by these ex-generals right away. The second argument, I think, which was a little bit more difficult to, to perhaps get across sometimes, but I think which was accepted as well, uh, was that these look like colonial era buildings, and they are colonial era buildings in the sense that they were built during the colonial era, uh, and they were built during British rule, uh, but that they have a long history since then as well, and, and that these are buildings that uh, are important not just to the history of colonialism, which we need to, to think about and, and remember and reflect on, uh, but they're also important for the whole social and political history of the country, including uh, the nationalist movements, the anti-colonial movement, uh, that these, this downtown area is where some of the greatest uh, Burmese statesmen, writers, poets, artists, others lived and worked for uh, many decades, uh, that this is the square mile or so, you see it in, in one of these pictures up there on the top, that this is the square mile or so where everything from the first jazz music was listened to in, to in Rangoon, to where the Communist Party was formed, to where the 1988 uprising took place. And this was a physical link to our past, and it was important uh, for the country uh, and for society, especially at this critical juncture in its history, uh, to preserve and, and, and not let go. And that became kind of accepted. And, and we, we, were, we were given permission to, uh, for the first time, put blue plaques on, on these buildings as a way of commemorating uh, their importance as well. Uh, the third element of the argument, though, is perhaps the most difficult, and I think is still not really fully taken on board, which is that you know, over the next, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, the most important thing for Rangoon will be to, to build up the right infrastructure, to make sure people have proper access to health care, that the city develops in terms of electricity and energy and transport and, and having a good port and airport and everything else. But that maybe 15 or 20 years from now, when we have all these things, hopefully, uh, that having a beautiful city is also something of great value, and that we will regret destroying that beautiful city uh, now. Um, we will regret it in, in, in 15 or 20 years' time. But that was very difficult, I think, for people to understand or, or imagine, um, and, and it remains a, a, a difficult challenge um, to, to this day. Um, but in general, partly because I had access to these ex-generals and partly because of an advocacy campaign that we started, uh, we went from initially from strength to strength. Partly it was a coincidence. It was 2011-12. Burma was reforming or thought it was reforming. And so everyone wanted to do something different and new. And the generals and the ministers themselves were eager to grab onto something that they felt showed that they were different than uh, their predecessors in the old military uh, junta. We were lucky because a number of uh, VIPs came through, and all of them, uh, Western VIPs, uh, sort of um, said the same thing or said similar things and weighed in on this as well. People like Kevin Rudd and Bob Carr in Australia, the Prince of Wales in the UK, and Barack Obama himself twice coming to Burma, and on both occasions uh, making a point of, of talking about and thinking about uh, Yangon's uh, physical uh, heritage and, and urban planning issues as well. Um, and so, you know, three or four years on, I had set up this organization that, that Professor Gordon had mentioned, the Yangon Heritage Trust. Again, originally I thought this was going to be something I set up and kind of let go, uh, but it was an incredibly difficult environment to set up any institution. Uh, there was just no ecosystem around which NGOs could easily be set up. So I got drawn into to the institutional development of this NGO. We, it wound up being about 30, 35 people. Uh, we did a lot of advocacy work, um, and basically over three or four years we were fairly successful in the sense that we managed to stop all the demolitions, uh, almost all the demolitions. Uh, again, you know, as I mentioned, between 1995 and 2010, over a thousand buildings were torn down. Once we started in 2011, maybe the number was about a dozen overall. 
Uh, I met one of these ex-generals at a reception uh, a year or so after I started campaigning, and he said, you're lucky you intervened when you did because we were about to knock down the whole lot of them. So in 2011, everything was in a very precarious state. By 2014, we had stopped the demolitions, and essentially the old city was protected uh, physically, even though the legislation and the regulations uh, were not in place. The Young and Heritage Trust, working on a shoestring with just some very dedicated Burmese architects and others, managed to provide technical assistance to over 100 different projects of, of renovation. Some of these buildings that you see that look a little bit nicer uh, are, are technical renovation projects that we've worked on. We managed to stop uh, potentially uh, uh, damaging new projects. So for instance, uh, some of you may know the Shwedegon Pagoda, which is in the center of, of Rangoon. Uh, someone had wanted to build, uh, invest $300 million in building high-rise condominiums all along the south flank of the, of the pagoda, which would have completely covered views of that uh, heritage landmark and, and religious site, and we managed to stop that. And instead, we managed to help attract $300 million in investment in, in the renovation of uh, many of the old buildings uh, that were there. But the big problem, you know, in, in a way, there's all this seems kind of straightforward. There's an old city, you want to save it, you want to stop the demolitions, you want to renovate it. But the, the, the problems in terms of moving ahead are, are extremely deep. Um, and in the time I have left, I'll just, I'll just mention a few things. One is that Rangoon, like the rest of Myanmar, is a legal mess. No one knows who owns what. Uh, and in downtown Yangon in particular, uh, land is contested. There's no uh, strata law. In the apartment building where I lived in, there were 20 different families, and everyone had completely different rights to, different, to the use of different space. Uh, the, the, the way in which all these buildings had been demolished before was that a developer, a construction company, would come. Uh, they would say to the people who lived in the building, look, if we knock down your beautiful 19th century building, we can build this cheap 10-story uh, new building, but you will have a slightly bigger part of that building. And some people would agree. If they didn't agree, that developer would go out and pay a bribe to the city authorities to have the building listed as a dangerous building. And then they would pressure the same tenants to agree that their old building could be knocked down. And so we managed to stop that. But the legal mess was still there, which meant actually going in and trying to help people renovate their buildings was, a, was an enormous problem. And it was, it was a problem as well, uh, because the bureaucracy in Burma is a complete mess too. And so moving on from a demolition pause to anything that resembled a government policy and scheme uh, around a plan of urban renewal that would actually benefit local people uh, required a degree of intra-government coordination and policy making, which was simply beyond the abilities of the Burmese government in 2011 and 2012. I would just add also that you know once we had started, we, we sort of broadened out our scope in a couple of different directions. I mean, one is perhaps the more obvious direction of urban planning more generally. In a normal country, you would be doing conservation work within a more general kind of conversation about urban planning. In, in Myanmar, there was no conversation about urban planning. So we, 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 we kind of had to f move into that vacuum and talk more generally about the future of the city, uh, what Yangon could be as a more green and livable city, to think about alternatives to the kind of urban development we've seen elsewhere in Southeast Asia. You think of Jakarta or Manila or Bangkok. Um, and that was a discussion that we tried to promote uh, from 2012 onwards. The second completely different direction was in the direction of kind of historical memory. Uh, again, this was a landscape of, of protest, of colonialism, of anti-colonialism, of trying to get people to think and, and, and reflect on that history. Uh, this was also uh, the most multi-ethnic landscape anywhere in the country. Uh, I lived in a neighborhood that was 40% Muslim, 20% Chinese, 30% uh, uh, Burmese Buddhist. It was a huge mix of different uh, people. Um, and at a time when there was so much inter-ethnic or eth ethnicity-related conflict and extreme violence against civilians and armed conflicts elsewhere in the country, this was far from an ideal space, but it was actually a space in which people from all over Asia, actually in terms of descent, but from all over Myanmar as well, were living together, people of many different faiths and stuff. And so we, we try to celebrate that, recognize that in different ways, and engage with uh, local neighborhoods, uh, especially the neighborhoods of, of people of, of Indian and, and, and Chinese as well as Burmese descent. Um, and finally, let me just say that I think you know the, the, the problems that, that we face maybe to some extent are, are similar to, to, to other countries, but maybe to some extent are unique. 
I mean, one is this, this, this problem of, of imagining something different. And, and because Burma was such an isolated country, uh, people, I think, had a difficult time imagining something other than uh, a future of, 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 of kind of unplanned development of new high rises and, and congested spaces. If people had been abroad, they'd have been abroad only to Bangkok, so that became a sort of symbol of, of, of the future that was desired. I remember in, um, in uh, 2012, I, I said to one minister at the time, wouldn't it be nice if we had this, you know, we had this big waterfront, and wouldn't it be nice if that waterfront was a promenade and a place of, of green spaces and public spaces and places where people could, uh, could relax and, and, and play sports and do different things, and, and we could have some cafes and things. And, and he said yes, and he was very polite and nodded. And then he came back to me a few months later, and he had just come back from his very first trip to Europe, and he said, now I know what you were talking about. You know, I had no idea when you said these things. Uh, I couldn't imagine at all what you were, what you were meaning. And so there, there was this problem of, of imagining something different. There was a huge problem of, of capacity that I had mentioned before, uh, of this uh, Dickensian labyrinth of, of bureaucratic institutions that were really uh, had evolved over 20 years simply to siphon off as much money from ordinary people as possible and give as little as possible in public services. So to turn that around and towards an urban planning agenda was, was not easy. Um, and, and finally, I think, you know, at this, I would just say that, you know, at this time when there's so many huge challenges in Myanmar, and this is the kind of sad ending part of it, uh, when, you know, even the whole democratic transition is, is, is up in the air. We've seen all the violence related to Rohingya people in the west of the country, continuation of armed conflict. This question, you know, where does this agenda like conservation uh, stand? Is it important at all to even think about at this time? And I would just say that, you know, what is very important is the future of our cities because more and more, you know, the country is becoming urbanized. The way in which our cities, which are multi-ethnic cities, are planned and conceived is an incredibly important part of almost every aspect of the future of the country, not least uh, the prospects for peace as well. So this is an area of urban planning uh, and thinking about conservation as a way of thinking about the past and, and, and the need to deal with the past in a, in a country as conflicted as Myanmar, I think is also a very important thing uh, going forward. So I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to uh, express my appreciation to the Engine Institute for inviting me to this. Uh, can I hear? For, for inviting me to this uh, uh, roundtable discussions. Because time is very limited, so so in the next ten minutes, I will give you a very very brief account about the preservation of the colonial architecture in Taiwan. And uh, my focus will be on the historic development rather than the uh, uh, theoretic argument. As you know, Taiwan uh, was, uh, uh, according to the Article 2 and 3 uh, of the Treaty of the Shimomo Seki Treaty, Taiwan was ceded to Japan as a colony. And influenced by the Meiji restorations, architecture of different functions in different styles were introduced by the Japanese architects into Taiwan immediately after their colonization in Taiwan. Political ideologies and the mentality strongly influenced the historic preservation in Taiwan in the early postmodern period. In the beginning of the nationalist government's rule in Taiwan after the World War II, the negative or in more correct term, hostile attitudes towards Japanese colonial objects were adopted. Buildings built in the Japanese colonial period were demolished or eliminated, less the government's term, intentionally especially those buildings associate with the Japanese militarism or Shinto tribes, that's Jinja. To support my argument, I'll show you some document. Unfortunately, it's in Chinese. There are public announcement uh, by the Taiwanese government to demolish the Japanese buildings. For example, this one is to to demolish the old memorial architecture. And this is the, to demolish the, the shrines to worship the Japanese emperor. But you, if you don't want to 
demolish that, then you can use it as a storage room. So that, that's the public announcement. And this, this one is for the spirit monument, and this one is to demolish the uh, Shinto shrine. But in the 1982, the Cultural Heritage Preservation Act was in act in Taiwan. However, the objects protected by the act were buildings with long history representing Chinese uh, culture. Consequently, the architecture built during the Japanese colonial period were ex excluded because of their non-Chinese and shop history. However, one thing happened in 1985. Taoyuan Shinto Shrine, that is Taoyuan Jinja, was scheduled to be demolished. The academic and the cultural circles stepped forward to appear for the preservation of this dedicated wooden shrines built in 1938. After a serious debate between two sides, the shrine was finally preserved. And this is the only surviving Shinto shrine outside Japan built before the, uh, 1945. However, in the reason for designation, the shrine was described as a Tang style buildings rather than a Japanese style building because during that time, to press Japanese colonial objects was still a taboo in Taiwan. So this is the Taoyuan Shinto shrine, which is now under protection. It's the only surviving shrine uh, outside Japan. In addition to Taoyuan Shinto shrines, the former Tainan district courthouse built in 1912 also faced a similar uh, demolition crisis in the beginning of 1990s. The demolition plan evoked opposition from people of different realms. Their gathering and the protest in front of the courthouse were treated by authority as illegal because at that time Taiwan was still under the control of martial law. Some of the protesters are actually being uh, summoned and inquired by the court. However, an avalanche of appeals for preserving this courthouse emerged, especially among law court scholars. The support soon spread across the entire Taiwan. Several public hearings were held. The preservation petition also received support from various mass media. And this is uh, one article in the magazines with the title saying that go to the courthouse for the sake of historic buildings, a war for preserving Tainan District Court House. So under the pressure, public pressure, the Ministry of Interior, that is the authority in charge of cultural heritage in Taiwan, called for a national monument meeting in which this Western style courthouse was designated as a national monument on the 2nd April 1991. It became the, one of the earliest Japanese period buildings to be designated as a legal cultural heritage site. The survey and the research of this courthouse began in 1986. In 1996, actually it was conducted by me and my colleagues at the university. And it takes almost 20 years to finish and complete the restoration in 2017. So you can see the changing attitude of the people. Since the designation of Thailand District Courthouse as National Monument in 1991, hundreds of buildings constructed during the Japanese colonial period has become the cultural heritage and are now protected by the law. Some of them receive the status of national monument. So you see different a variety of the building. This is one of the earliest uh, weather ob observatory in Asia. This is one of the earliest uh, modern hospital and a fire bureau, leisure pavilion in the park built in 1908, a radio broadcast bureau. And actually this is the factory for tobacco. So another uh, picture show you the, the Japanese dormitory, city hall, assembly hall, high school, martial art hall, street house, 
Buddhist monastery and Department of Justice missionary schools. They are all now under protection. So in the past, people in Taiwan might ask why they should preserve colonized buildings. And the answer were divided. For those who were born, grew up, and educated during the Japanese period, the answer is always yes. For those who come from China after 1945, the answer is always no, because they think they always treat Japan as an enemy, and they blame the Japan for their failure uh, during the civil war in on the Chinese mainland. But gradually, the most people recognize that Taiwan was colonized by the Japanese is a historic fact. If it is a historic fate, they cannot be erased by demolishing buildings of that particular period. And the buildings of every period are equally important for constructing Taiwan's history and identity. Japanese colonial rule was very important to the history of modern Taiwan. The colonial rule was instrumental in industrialization and the modernization of Taiwan. The Japanese completed the uh, railroad system. They built extensive sanita sanitation system, and they found a modern educational system. People did enjoy a better material life when compared with that uh, during the Qin Dynasty in Taiwan. So nowadays, the Japanese coloni colonial buildings in Taiwan not only witness a pluralistic and multicultural society, but also become inseparable parts of the life of many people. Many of them are adopted to use as museums, shops, restaurants, schools. They are valued as heritage sites and safeguard by the majority of people in Taiwan now. It is almost impossible to demolish a Japanese period buildings in Taiwan now because there are always people, they will stand up and say, no, you cannot demolish the, the Japanese period building because they are our heritage. And in this in this picture, you also see some of the interesting scenes. This is one of the earliest department store built in 1931 in Taiwan. It was abandoned for several years, but it reopened three years ago as a department store. And now it's one of the most attractive spots in Tainan now. And this is the museum of the uh, natural history, you, you can see the dinosaur here. And actually, it was a bank before restoration. And this is the Japanese dormitory, now it's the Museum of the Literature. And this is the sugar factory, but now it's, a, it's kind of the theme park. And this is the eye clinic, now it's the most famous ice cream shop in Taiwan. So people enjoy it all kinds of the Japanese colonial buildings <coughs> in Taiwan. And they say they, these buildings are, are now part of their heritage. This is what I want to explain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, honestly, um, colonialism and the post-colonialism are very obscure terms for me because I work in Italian Renaissance and those terms constitute a major lacuna in my knowledge system as an architectural historian. Uh, but on the other hand, modernism is a term abused by Chinese architects who still stubbornly treat that as a style which they can extract from its intricate cultural historical background and then adapt it to their own practice. But today I don't have to wrestle with 
these elusive uh, isms, um, so thank goodness. But still, uh, the two modifiers, the colonial and modern, are not easy to circumvent, especially in the Chinese context. That's why I put those quotation marks around those terms. Uh, colonial has a very different connotation uh, in China than in other regions, such as South America and Africa. I grew up with an education that treated colonial as indisputably suppressive and completely destructive, something associated with a series of unequal treaties which were signed by the Qing dynasty with Western powers during the 19th and early 20th century. Back then, in our school, uh, in our narrative of Chinese history, it's always been paired with another evil dark force, the feudal. So our school textbooks would adopt the Marxist theory of half semi-colony. According to the standard narrative, in the aftermath of the Opium Wars, our country began to descend to a semi-colonial, semi-feudal society, which took its full form following the signing of the Boxer Protocol at the dawn of the 20th century, and then came to an end with the founding of the PRC. So how do we define the architectural legacy of this long century? Semi-colonial and semi-feudal architecture would certainly sound weird, right? Uh, what's so feudal about this legacy? So how about modern architecture? Well, that's even more problematic because such terms as modern, early modern, or pre-modern are also elusive in a Chinese context, and sometimes they're even used interchangeably. When I was a student at Tsinghua University, there were two general survey courses in architectural history. One is Chinese and the other is foreign. By foreign, we mean encompassing all, like from American and European and uh, um, uh, Asia outside China and also Africa, everything. Um, so each of these two, Chinese and foreign, was subdivided into um, ancient and modern. So altogether, we had four textbooks. History of ancient Chinese architecture, history of modern Chinese architecture, history of uh, ancient foreign architecture, and history of modern foreign architecture. Anyway, the narrative follows a strict chronological order and combines approaches of social history and the formal analysis. The stylistic terms used to address the semi-colonial and semi-feudal period were obscure and inconsistent, which confused everyone. But no one seemed to care or dare to ask questions. I can't even remember if the term colonial architecture appeared in the history of modern Chinese architecture textbook because I barely managed to pass the exam. Now, almost two decades have passed, and I'm surprised to find that the titles, narrative structure, terms, and contents of these textbooks remain largely intact. The binary mentality of Chinese versus foreign and ancient versus modern even find its way into the architecture volume in the new Encyclopedia Sinica. So with such arbitrary approach, you would find it almost impossible to even define the kind of architectural legacy that concerns us today. Now, let me share a story. But I should warn you from the start that this story may not bring you comfort or peace of mind. Uh, the story is from my hometown, Jinan, capital city of Shandong province, which was a German colony, or more appropriately, half colony, semi-colony. Um, that makes sense, because unlike the Hispanic America or the Francophone Africa, there's no such thing as Germanic Shandong. Sometimes when I mention the colonial history of Shandong to my German colleagues, I get curious questions like, so you speak German? <laughs> and my answer is yes and no. No, the natives of Shandong don't speak German. Yes, I studied German because it was a prerequisite for art history. Um, but we did have buildings designed by the German. During the 19th century, China became increasingly exposed to Western influence. And the coastal province of Shandong was especially affected. Qingdao was leased to Germany in 1897 and Weihai to Britain in 1898, and the rest of Shandong became part of the German sphere of influence. We used to have a lot of handsome buildings from this period, but sadly, most of them have been destroyed or dilapidated. 
compared to Shanghai or Taipei, cities that have managed to preserve an architectural memory of their colonial or half-colonial past, we have done a very poor job in Shandong. The building you see in the old photograph and the sketch no longer exists. It was a Jinan station on two major uh, railway artillery, um, which was once a world famous landmark in China, which was designed by the German architect engineer Hermann Fischer and completed in 1912. It was once regarded as the biggest and the most beautiful railway station that had ever been built by the Germans in Far East. Um, my great grandfather saw its cons construction. I myself witnessed the entire process of process of its destruction. At the time when Hermann Fischer designed the beauty, he was only 24, a recent graduate in engineering. How he could have got this job to design the most beautiful train station in the East Asia remains largely unknown. It's a mystery. When I was a little girl, my grandma lived just a few blocks away from the station in a lively neighborhood where traditional courtyard houses blended with handsome mansions built by the Germans. Uh, I can show you more pictures of the station. And this is all from old photographs. Okay, let's back there. Yeah. Um, nearby the station, there was also a school and a hospital in a sort of Baroque revival style, both run by the German diplomats working in Jinan. Um, in those days, I was reading fairy tales in my grandma's courtyard, and um, those beautiful exotic bay windows and glazed red tiles and the green dome of the bell tower, all of these um, details fired my imagination for a wonderland. And I also remember the fantastic feeling upon entering the United Station for the first time. The dreamy, ethereal feeling of its vast interior forever cast a spell on my mind. But there was no happily ever after in real life. In 1992, the station was dismantled by the Jinan Railway Administration in order to build a modern station to ease transportation pressure, in case you want to see how the modern station looks like it's right next to it. So you have, have a comparison of the old and the new, okay? Um, so that was the uh, official excuse. Uh, there's also another factor in the demolition of the building. Following the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown, China faced international sanctions and the domestic instability. So at that time, uh, there was a kind of xenophobia. The government feared any Western influence. So the station was targeted as a reminder of suppression from, by the foreign forces. Um, and uh, Xie Yutang, the then deputy mayor of Jinan, who had very little education, school education, he told the local media that um, the station was a symbol of imperialism. And, though, and also he famously <coughs> said that the Green Dome of the station reminded him of um, Hitler's army, as if he had no Hitler in person. So anyway. Um, so the government's decision to demolish the building really caused a public sensation. Academics and the locals as well were strongly opposed to the demolition and even they filed several rounds of petition, but despite all that, the government decided to erase and to, you know, flight the entire station. Um, I remember an archaeologist who wouldn't have his name revealed because of the sensitive nature of the issue. He famously said that the railway station witnessed many big events in modern China, from the demise of the Qing dynasty to the rise of the republic, and the Japanese revision, uh, 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 invasion, and also the civil war between the nationalists and the communists, all that. Well, the story didn't end with demolition. Two decades later, in 2012, a total of 11 people, including a municipal people's congress member in Jinan, suggested rebuilding the old railway station in its original form. Since the original drawings didn't survive, I mean, the authorities almost turned the local archives upside down, and even they tried, they tried to track down the descendants of the architect German Fisher, but despite their efforts, they were only um, a few old photographs, all the blueprints, all the details, everything has disappeared. 
did it survive? Um, so given that they proposed to use the older photographs as a reference during the design and construction of the rebuilding, um, on August 2013, the Jinan Old City Development and Investment Group announced that it will invest 1.5 billion yuan to restore the old Jinan station, railway station. Interestingly, at the news conference, they referred to the station as Germanic style. Once again, the authorities' decision aroused big controversies and uh, attracted fierce criticism. Many people believed that rebuilding the station would be another stupid decision. One of them said that it is impossible to rebuild the station in its original form when the materials and the technology have changed and the building drawings are missing. Another said that the station could never be restored to its former glory, even if the drawings were available, because present day, the architect's attitude and approach towards the railway station cannot be the same. Now, five years have passed. The suggestion of rebuilding the old station is still under serious consideration. Meanwhile, the entire neighborhood where my grandma lived has been demolished in whose place now stand a gigantic shopping mall and a modern pastiche of period style shops. And these two buildings are the only ones surviving from that period, which used to stand side by side with the old Jinan railway station. With all my training as an architectural historian, I feel helpless whenever the story of the old station comes to mind. It carried a very dear childhood memory, but I was too young to feel anything when it was torn down. In the academic narrative of our architectural history, I can't even find any single term to properly define it. Chinese or foreign, ancient or modern, colonial or half-colonial, none seems to do it justice. Given all that has happened, I can't even find a compelling reason for it to reborn. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kim hyun Seop from Korea University, and I was a uh, uh, 2014 to 15 vis visiting scholar to uh, Yanshin Institute. I have been working as a, an architectural historian and critic, and I think I am very, very greatly honored to be invited here uh, for this wonderful academic event. Um, this very short talk, my title of this talk is Ambivalence, How to Deal with Colonial Architecture in Korea. The term ambivalence um, signifies the coexistence of two contradictory attitudes of Koreans toward colonial architecture. Uh, and I adopted this term actually from the post-colonial theorist Homi Baba, a professor at Harvard, and also originally it's also from uh, psychoanalytical uh, theories. For example, uh, Freud regarded the Oedipus complex as the most typical idea uh, of ambivalence, typical example of ambivalence because it shows the, the coexistence of uh, love and hate, the two contradictory desires. Um, this cover image is very uh, fascinating. You can see here, uh, yes, uh, this building um, is the Japanese government general building, and this building is Gyeongseong prefectural office. Gyeongseong means uh, Seoul, the present Seoul. So these two buildings symbolizes the Japanese colonial rule. One is for the whole Korean Peninsula, the other for the uh, great Seoul metropolitan area. And it is also very interesting if you can recognize the letters here, the stamp. In Korean, 조선 총독부. Uh, in, in English, 조선 government general or Japanese government general. So uh, this cover image symbolizes the colonial period of Korea. Um, we e, have still many colonial buildings in Korea exist. For example, Gyeongseong Station. Yeah, just now, Professor Liu talked about the station. This is, uh, in Korean case, Gyeongseong 
station is Seoul station, but now it is used as a uh, culture station, so kind of an exhibition space. And this is Gyeongseong Prefectural Office, the present Seoul Municipal Library. And Gyeongseong Law Court is now used as a Seoul Museum of Art. Um, re reflecting Korean history since its liberation uh, from Japan in 1945, I can pinpoint one very important event that aroused the heated debate on colonial archi architecture in Korea. That was the demolition of Japanese government general building in Seoul. This building was, ha had been used as Korean government building and then National Museum of Korea after the liberation, but it came to be demolished uh, in 1995 and 1996 to celebrate the Korea's 50th anniversary from, anniversary, uh, yeah, Korea's 50th anniversary of independence from Japan. Uh, you can see here the original building when it was built, and this right-hand side two photographs shows the uh, comparison before and after the demolition of the Japanese government general building. Um, this is the uh, uh, photograph that shows the original situation. This is the government general building, and this is Gunjongjeon, the most symbolic building in Gyeongbokgung Palace. But if you compare this photograph with the uh, restored Gyeongbokgung Palace, we can understand that to build this government general building, Japanese people uh, demolished many uh, part of the uh, Gyeongbokgung Palace. And my final photograph, this is very interesting and symbolic because it signifies the death of the uh, Japanese government general building. The situation here that um, this building, the uppermost power of the building is being removed by the crane uh, is often compared with a criminal who is being beheaded. <laughs> so um, it is a very symbolic photograph. And um, this building was the target for demolition because it is the symbol of Japanese colonialism. And the fact that this building was built within the area of Gyeongbokgung is, had, had always been problematic because the Gyeongbokgung Palace uh, was the central royal palace of Joseon dynasty over 500 years up to 1910 when Korea was colonized by Japan. So preservation or demolition? That was the question given to Koreans at the time. And uh, the debate over the issue has not clearly resolved yet. Uh, on the one hand, many Koreans wanted to clear away the vestige of Japanese colonialism, especially from the Joseon dynasty's symbolic location. But on the other hand, however, others thought that its preservation might be better because the colonial period also belongs to Korean history and the monumental building itself is very uh, remarkable in terms of architecture. And, and also, uh, this building, as I already told you, had been used continually as important national institutions since the liberation. Um, however, in the end, this building came to be demolished following the governmental policy at the time and also uh, under the support of many uh, Koreans. And, uh, nevertheless, however, uh, in the meantime, it seems that there was a slight change in the attitude. Uh, rather than demolition, but preservation and reuse of colonial architecture seems to be uh, highly regarded recently. Uh, I think that is the kind of a reaction, uh, uh, possibly the reaction to the uh, demolition of Japanese government general building and also no other buildings can accompany such a strong 
pro-demolition argument as the Japanese government building uh, because of its strong allusion to colonialism. Uh, at this point, I think I better uh, talk about registered cultural property system to protect uh, cultural uh, property in Korea. Uh, this registered cultural property system was introduced in Korea in 2001 uh, before the introduction of this system, state-designated cultural property system was the main um, protection law. Uh, before the introduction of this new system, uh, owners of a uh, building regarded as cultural heritage could not make the most of their building. If the state designated the building as a cultural property, uh, they wanted to make the most of the building, but it should be frozen just preserved as it is. But under the new system, um, a building regarded as cultural heritage could be remodeled and renovated and made the most of as far as its for, uh, formal qualities, formal structure in the exterior is preserved. So now, owners of uh, historically and culturally valuable buildings uh, are not being forced to choose either preservation or or demolition. Uh, so uh, now we can say that this registered cultural property system is quite helpful to preserve colonial architecture in Korea. So to conclude this very, very short uh, my talk, I think this system um, is one of many solutions uh, to preserve uh, cultural heritage in Korea and also to deal with the Korean the, the ambivalent attitude of Koreans toward colonial architecture. However, in fact, uh, this is very practical uh, solution to deal with these things. Uh, if I am given a longer time to talk, another chance, I want to talk more, or I want to investigate uh, this big issue on colonial architecture on a more fundamental level, possibly in relation to the psychoanalytical or post-colonial colonial, uh, theories uh, that I adopted, uh, uh, from which I, uh, I adopted the uh, term um, ambivalence. Thank you very much. Thank you all for really wonderful presentations. And now can I ask the um, panelists to all come up and s sit here so we can have some discussion. Uh, I think first I'll give panelists a chance to ask each other questions or comments or responses uh, and then open it up to the audience. I was, I was very struck by both some clear differences maybe in the timing or staging of the move to reconsider cultural heritage comparing um, especially Taiwan and, and uh, Korea, but actually the big pictures of ambivalence were not as, as profoundly different as, I, different as I thought they might be. And uh, also a common issue across all four of these presentations seemed to be that there's an, an issue of vision and conceptualization, coming to understand that it's important to preserve this particular type of heritage, and then figuring out process, politics, regulations, which is a separate matter. And it's, it, I, one question I just would pose to anybody who wants to ask it, uh, answer it, I mean, is the buildings you were presenting were for the most part grand, large structures connected with official and public life. But there would also, of course, be a kind of vernacular or daily life dimension which may not have changed that much under colonial era compared to earlier or later. So maybe it doesn't emerge so much, but are there efforts in any of the cases you are aware of to preserve that type of sort of, um, Professor Liu mentioned the neighborhood around the station is transforming fundamentally, which makes the restoration of the station have a very different meaning than if that neighborhood was still intact. But are there efforts to, to preserve the daily life heritage of this era as well as this more monumental heritage? Yeah, in Korea we have those kind of movements. Um, those colonial eras 
Japanese style buildings, also now regarded as kind of cultural resources, and uh, some uh, for some shops and for daily use, people try to uh, uh, preserve those things. Of course, in in, in that case, uh, they can get some financial funds from government, really? and and it it is quite a fashion, so it can attract more people, and so it is very profitable. Yeah, maybe in, in definitely in, in, in our case, in Yangon, um, I don't have a map, but it, you know, it's, it's a couple of square miles, a few hundred thousand people, where the big public buildings are you know, relatively well protected. And the ones that were always most in danger were the small privately owned buildings. Uh, and as I'd mentioned before, I mean, this is a landscape where you have so many different uh, ethnic communities, people from different parts of China, people from all parts of South Asia. Um, and it's also a square mile where you have over 100 different religious buildings. You have both an Anglican and a Roman Catholic cathedral. You have three dozen uh, mosques, uh, uh, Shia and Sunni. You have 15 Hindu temples, five Chinese temples as well as several dozen uh, Buddhist structures as, as well. But in between all of that, you have these streets where you have families, uh, again, from, from different parts of the world and different parts of Asia and, and Burma, who have been there for, for generations. And so a big part of our work was not just trying to kind of, you know, sort of protect the buildings, because it was the danger that you would gentrify the whole area and just open it up to a certain type of tourism, but really to try to engage with the local communities and see what would help them want to preserve their own buildings and also keep these neighborhoods uh, and communities intact as well. In Taiwan, we have a very special kind of the colonial buildings that is uh, uh, Japanese wooden dormitories built by Japanese uh, when they were in Taiwan. They built this kind of the dormitory in order to solve the problem of the Japanese people who feel un uncomfortable uh, living in the traditional Taiwanese architecture. So after the, the Japanese left, the, the nationalist government moved in. So the Japanese style houses became the dormitories of the nationalist government officials. Our teachers, there's a bit amounts of this kind of dormitories. And then now, this kind of dormitory became one of the main focus for preservation. So it's, it's not a grand building, it's just the wooden houses with tatami, mm -hmm. Japanese mat. So several days ago, several weeks ago, there's a team of Japan who reached Taiwan, and uh, they are very surprised to find that, that in Taiwan, so many houses, they are still have the tatami. And they mm -hmm. said Taiwan probably have the the more tatamis than anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in my case, I guess uh, it depends on where you live, um, as we discussed uh, during the lunch time. I, I mean, if I present a case from Beijing or Shanghai, it might be totally different. But in Jinan, as a provincial capital, we uh, have a notoriously stupid government who uh, doesn't care m much about uh, preservation of historical valued um, buildings, uh, whether it's grand scale or um, having a dimension of daily life. Um, even now, they are putting up this huge project of regeneration of uh, the neighborhood from that, that um, period, colonial period. They, uh, have a different purpose. It's not what it seems like. Um, namely, they are trying to, you know, regenerate as a cultural, um, um, a cultural action of, you know, um, with the excuse to uh, boost the local economy. But behind the scenes, their real purpose is to make a profit. Is to, for example, even the rebuilding of the old Jinan railway station is a front for the development of the property. Also, they wouldn't. They would never say it publicly, and uh, um, yeah, I guess that's really a problem. So uh, the real force behind um, the action to uh, preserve uh, the colonial era architecture comes from the non-governmental organizations. Uh, 
a few of which I know personally, but they are really doing a very hard job trying to get all the means and the resources, so. Thank you. Do any of you have questions for the, or comments on what you heard from your fellow panelists, things that surprised you or struck you as interestingly similar or different? I think Professor Fu's presentation is quite similar to me. You are, you are a term from positive attitude to negative attitude. From so, negative to uh, sorry, <laughs> from negative to positive. So the emphasis was put on the uh, positive, and in my presentation too, is quite similar. But I more emphasize the ambivalence, the two uh, different. Uh, opinion and two different attitudes exist. Uh, 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 from my experience, when I first visited Taiwan, I was quite surprised that Taiwanese people quite like Japanese. But in Korea, in fact, it's very sensitive, especially this year, uh, 2019, is the centenary year uh, of the 3-1 nationalist movement toward Japan. So it's very difficult to say. So, on the one hand, on the other hand, two different sides. And I, I want to hear your opinion about Ta Taiwanese context. Uh, I think this is uh, two ways of thinking. You know, once you are uh, thinking these heritages from the aspect of the cultural cosmopolitan, then you think that uh, this heritage is for the whole mankind. And you are thinking from the cultural nationalist, then then you are thinking only your uh, heritage, not other people's heritage. I think one turning point in Taiwan is that uh, beginning from the, the end of the 1990s, uh, and the curriculum in elementary school, they are asking pupils, students, to go out and uh, do the survey of the heritage around your schools. And mm -hmm. I think it helps a lot because the, the student, when they are doing this kind of survey or investigation, they find their parents or their grandparents, they are actually <laughs> study in that school, the Japanese colonial period school. So they start to write the story and it helps a lot to, to present preserve all this kind of the, 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 the heritage. And I think, as I mentioned uh, in my talk, but in a very short term, because in, in Taiwan, the Japanese people, they, they, they did something good to Taiwan. So, so people in Taiwan enjoyed attending the school. They enjoyed the, a better life during the Japanese period. So, the, the most the infrastructure were com completed by the Japanese. So, so that's why the people in, in Taiwan, they, they are not, <laughs> what do you say, it looks like a Japanese, but they, they, they respect the period mm. so when Japanese are, are there. Um, I here, I put two very different uh, cultural pro uh, cultural pro uh, property protection law in Korea, and this uh, registered cultural property system was introduced in Korea in 2001. I think other countries also has similar uh, law or system. Probably Taiwan also. We had the, the law beginning from the 1982, almost oh, 20 Thailand. years. Yeah, mm. <laughs> head of Korea. But at that time, the, the, the object protected is very, very, the scope is very narrow. But uh, after the earthquake, the, there is a big earthquake in Taiwan in 1999. And the earthquake destroyed many historic buildings. And people start to realize that uh, all, all these buildings have to be uh, protected. So we expand the scope for protection. So we started beginning from the 1982. I had a question, that Tom, I mean, for you, because in relation, my impression is that in relation to 
or in comparison to a Chinese view of the semi-colonial status or in a Taiwanese or Korean view of Japan as a colonizer, that a Burmese view of the British isn't so fraught that people want to tear down buildings because they were put up by the British, or is there, am I wrong about that? Well, I think you there, didn't mention no, that I as think, an issue. Yeah, I think there are different views. I mean, there's a there's a there's a current or a strain of Burmese nationalism that's extremely anti-British, anti-colonial, and so you had under General Ne Win in the in the 1970s, 1980s, the I think the the, the deliberate tearing down of of major colonial era buildings partly because of that sort of nationalist anti-colonial element. And I think even today there's, you know, every time in our advocacy and when we work and when we put up stuff on social media, there are always some comments that, that come from, from that direction. But I think in general our, our advocacy on this issue and our, our attempts to kind of make the argument that this is part of our, our not just a global heritage, but it's also part of our own history and, and needs to be protected for all the different reasons I mentioned. I think that's so far, it's 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 won the argument. I think if I could respond or or, or to say something, I think that a big difference that we have, and maybe this is the same in China to some extent as well, is that you know we're in a in a period in in Burma these past five six years or in Yangon where there's an enormous disparity between people's incomes and the and the value of real estate for development, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know you have in downtown Yangon, you have most people who would make you know, an income of, say, $300 a month would be a good, a good income for people living downtown. Um, and in Yangon, by 2015, rents on a three-, four-bedroom house um, in a good neighborhood were up to $30,000 a month in rent. Um, and so there was an enormous <laughs> skyrocketing of real estate prices. So, of course, everyone wanted to tear down what they could and build as high up as possible, and we've just managed to kind of keep that at bay. But how long that lasts is, is very difficult to say. That, that's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive. Right? <laughs> well, why don't we open it up to those of you in the audience who might have questions or comments, and you can address them uh, across the board to all of the panelists or to a particular person. I'd ask that you identify uh, yourself and, and perhaps keep it to, to one question per person. I see a couple hands back there, Carter, and then... The, Thank you. I apologize for coming in late. I was at a departmental meeting I could not avoid. <laughs> uh, so I missed uh, the first two uh, panelists. Uh, my, my question is, is um, for Professor Kim, I think, primarily. Um, maybe I should just tell you an anecdote first. That might be interesting. And then the question. A number of years ago, when I was in uh, Penang, which is a very beautiful town, um, I was so impressed with the white colonial architecture, which really stands out there. And I met some students, and I said, well, what about this architecture? I said, this is colonial. How do you feel about this? And the response was, was generally, it's so beautiful, and it's part of our history. And I thought, wow, how different from Korea. Uh, <laughs> so my, my question, um, actually, uh, sort of uh, maybe two questions, but they're perhaps related, um, picking up on Professor uh, Gordon's um, uh, question, uh, if you go outside Seoul, you talk primarily about Seoul and the government, government general building, but if you go outside Seoul, uh, particularly say to Busan, which was a very uh, Japanese city uh, with a large Japanese population during the colonial period, also Mokpo, which was a major port, uh, if you go to those two cities today, you'll still see a lot of Japanese buildings, not necessarily government buildings, but houses, stores uh, in the Japanese style. And in, particularly in Pusan, there's a whole area, which you probably know, Nampodong, which is just, it looks a little like Japan even still today. And I wondered if there had been any kind of preservation efforts locally or regionally um, uh, within those two cities or any, any other cities, or ambivalence um, as you were describing it, and controversies uh, in the local areas outside of, outside of Seoul. And then the second question, and this is maybe, um, I don't want to get you into trouble, but <laughs> uh, recently President Moon Jae-in, uh, on the 100th anniversary uh, of the March 1st movement, which, which you mentioned, made a point of saying that it was, I forget the exact words, maybe you remember, but uh, it was very necessary to 
erase or eliminate uh, Japanese vestiges in the society. So this raises the question of what this means, perhaps, with regard to architecture, uh, if anything. And I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, especially a very difficult question. <laughs> the first one may be easier. Um, yeah, Busan, Mokpo, and I think Gunsan may be uh, one of the similar cities. And for example, in Gunsan, there are several and many uh, Japanese colonial buildings, and they try to uh, preserve those buildings. And the buildings, very ironically, is used as a museum to show some anti-Japanese uh, <laughs> policies, or etc. So it's very controversial, very, very difficult question. However, uh, many local cities also have their own local government, and they try to keep the, uh, their history uh, even though yeah, it's very ambivalent. And uh, after all, I think, it is to make the economy flourish. It mm. can attract many people, and it can attract tourism, and it can make the economy flourish. That's, I think, very, very fundamental uh, thing that move all those movement in this very global economic capitalist society. And the second question is really, really difficult. Yes, this is 100 years anniversary year, uh, 2019. And uh, so, yeah, not, not just Moon Jae-in government, but any government, I think, will do the similar things. And, oh, but in architectural area, yeah, still many people think, mm, uh, and uh, for a long time, many colonial buildings demolished massively. So now we uh, relatively have a small number of buildings of colonial period. So in architecture, in architectural society, people in general try to preserve those things. And we can learn a lot from the colonial buildings, historically and architecturally, etc. Yes, um, right, okay. Um, this question is for Liu Chen. I was at Tsinghua 20 years ago helping organize the UAA conference translating Professor Wu Long Young's speech and Kenneth Frampton's speech from the US. <clears throat> but I was also at a conference here at Harvard organized by the Chinese students before the Beijing Olympics in which there was a contingency from Tsinghua protesting the buildings that were going up there. My question is, in terms of ambivalence, would China now, with Xi Jinping's call for a renaissance in China, be ambivalent towards the Soviet-style buildings? Would that be considered colonial? Well, <laughs> so it buildings? Uh, that's really a difficult question. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, I don't see any association um, between um, colonialism and the Soviet uh, style buildings in, in China. I mean, we shared a communist past, right? Um, actually, this reminded me of my, one of my previous experience. I visited Poland once, and I went to the city of Warsaw. And when I was wandering out of the old, old city, I mean, the old city was totally rebuilt after it was de destroyed by war. I mean, the, the, now you say the rebuilt old city is a fake, but it's a world heritage site. And when I was wandering outside the uh, center of Warsaw, I thought, wow, this looks so familiar. It reminded me always, you know, the Soviet grand style um, big buildings, and even the main building of Tsinghua University is modeled on the Soviet style. But I, I, I really don't see any connection between colonial style and the Soviet building. I <laughs> okay, the gentleman in the back there had his hand up for a while. Yes. 
Hi, uh, David Dappas from the Ash Center. Hi, Tom. Uh, I have a question for Tom. Um, the, as you know, probably there's a 20,000 new Yangon acre, new Yangon town. Is there anything of historical interest in that? And if there is, are there any conversations about you know saving anything in that? Because the the firm that got it, I understand, is not always very sensitive. But uh, it, it, if I may, let me just ask Chen Lu. I, I was reading something in the New York Times about Hong Kong, and a Hong Kong preservationist said that we have destroyed so much, we have to think about preserving the future, not the past. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if outside of maybe Beijing and Shanghai, that's the case in much of China. And that would be my second question. I'm sorry to slip two in. It's okay. <laughs> Sure. I mean, I basic. I n not not very much. I mean, what what um, what was mentioned is a is a plan to build a new city ostensibly for two million people across the river from Yangon. This is uh, conceived as part of China's Belt Road Initiative. Uh, the Chinese uh, government are are uh, promoting uh, uh, Chinese company CCCC to build this city over the next few years. Um, it's on a huge um, uh, piece of land about the size of Singapore, uh, but it's farmland. And so it's possible there may be some small religious sites, but those I think would be just naturally protected anyway. Uh, but beyond that, it's, it's farmland, uh, and so I don't think that there's anything of, of, of certainly of colonial architecture uh, or anything else that would be considered of heritage value, as far as I know. Yes. Um, uh, Fairbank Center, just one comment about the Yangon situation. Um, it does seem to me from your comment about the uh, former general who went to Paris and realized what you were talking about, that one of the best ways to invest money in a closed society is to open their minds by a bit of travel to see what has happened in cities that have preserved their cultural traditions. Um, and um, Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a quick comment on that. I think that um, I think that's right, and I think we, that that happened. I think you had in from 2011 onwards a lot of people in senior positions uh, traveling around the world and traveling to Europe, and and we had actually specific uh, trips that were organized uh, for the mayor and for other top officials to to Britain or to, to places in Europe uh, with exactly that in mind. I think the problem is then they come back and then they're still not sure what to do. Um, and sometimes we have experts and come in from abroad, from Canada, from Australia, from elsewhere, and they come up with great plans that would be great to implement in Vancouver or Brisbane, but are impossible to implement in Yangon. And so we have this huge gap still between the local political economy and the local bureaucratic capacity, and at least the degree of political will that's, that's there, and, and that gap has been extremely difficult to bridge. If I could just ask um, a, a question about Hanoi. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Um, I have a vague recollection that it was still while Ho Chi Minh was alive that the big issue of what part of the city to uh, preserve uh, became a very, uh, a very tense moment. And Ho Chi Minh, as I understand it, decided on in favor of preservation. Uh, which I think Hanoi still benefits from today. Uh, a lot of the French uh, colonial history is preserved in Hanoi, and if any comments, would be interested. Maybe we'll let Wei Tom answer. I was there for the first time in my life in January, and I have to say I was desperately searching for um, um, traces of France and was hard-pressed to find them. But let's let Hui Tom Tai answer that question. Well, it's not quite this story, uh, there certainly was um, some discussion about preservation versus modernization, but during Ho Chi Minh's time, the people who would have done any kind of architecture would be the Cubans or the Soviets. And a lot of people who in the 1990s uh, advocated for historical preservation of colonial buildings were members of scholars who were all herded into Soviet-style apartments and were able to appreciate 
the architecture of the colonial period. Um, if you go to Hanoi and you go down the big street in front of the cathedral, they're all houses that were that date from the uh, French period. They're much more airy. They have higher ceiling instead of the low, low ceilings that are more suitable to winter in the Soviet Union or Russia than in tropical Hanoi, right? So um, there was the, <coughs> the socialist era with its Cuban-inspired or Soviet-inspired architecture made the advocacy of French colonial uh, architecture much easier. Thank you. I, I saw some hands over on this side of the room, so uh, the, the three here, um, let's go in turn um, in any order. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll go from you and then, then the next two. I have a question for Professor King. Yeah, I come from China, and I know that uh, Korea has a long history of being colonized by China, although the Chinese uh, style of colonizing is totally different from Western colonization. But colonization of Korea uh, was indeed uh, there. So I'm very curious about uh, some stories of how Korean protect uh, uh, Chinese style buildings in your country. Thank you. Are we colonized Korea? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I think it is very difficult to say that Korea was colonized by China. Yeah, it's very ha has very yeah. long history. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I was taught by Chinese history. Yeah, I am a historian, uh, although I I, I study. How, how do we design. define how do we define colonization? Uh, yeah, uh, as I said before. It's very, very different. It's very, very different. Yeah, I would like uh, the, to the Chinese style, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, for example, let me give you an example. The nearest period is under the, uh, the, the ruling of uh, Yuan Shikai. Do you know that? Mm. Yeah, know that. So we, we don't, we don't uh, send military, send army to your country, but uh, you are very uh, influenced by Chinese politics yeah uh, sometimes especially in 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 ancient korea you have to you have to ask uh ask our kings our emperor to uh, to uh, to make policies in your country so that's we uh, define the colonization so that's why i say the colonization style in china is is totally different I think that's very controversial comments, and it's very difficult to say that Korea yeah, was yeah, colonized yes. by that's China. How but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but it is true that Korea was influenced by China a lot uh, in terms of architecture too. Um, we it was influenced by Chinese architecture, the timber frame architecture, in Zhao Fashu, the, yes. the Chinese timber structure rule influenced Korea, and we also built like that. But uh, very uh, modest size and smaller. And we developed our unique style of architecture, even though we have some yeah, common point. So um, I think that question is very difficult to so, answer and so accept. Maybe, maybe I can ask you from another point, uh, uh, from another t um, perspective. So it, are there uh, some Chinese style buildings which were built in ancient time? Wh which is Chinese style building? Yeah, I, uh, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, first of all, we have to uh, clarify what do you mean by Chinese style. Is it a fixed style, architectural style? Uh, style. Yeah, because you know, as a history of Chinese architecture spans a long, a very long time, and it's a, certainly the, those buildings from the Qing Dynasty would be totally different from those from the Tang Dynasty. Yes, yes. So, which which Chinese style which do you Chinese refer style? to? Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So, uh, if uh, if we can accept the the political rhetoric, maybe. The political rhetoric of which side? Which side of the political rhetoric? Which side? Uh, I haven't finished. Please let me finish my, my, my remarks. So, uh, 
well, uh, that's my point. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Because uh, I was taught that uh, Korea has been colonized by China uh, from in a very ancient time. Uh, not only not only one uh, by one dynasty, but but maybe by several dynasty, um, maybe uh, from Tang, and, and I'm, I'm not uh, very uh, clear about that, but, uh, but uh, we can find that, uh, that conclusion, and that uh, p political rhetoric uh, from our uh, historical textbooks. Uh, so so I, I just want to know that. Uh, are there any Chinese style buildings? Maybe you, you say that, uh, y yes, it's difficult to, to 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 identify which one is Chinese style, which one is Japanese style, because we are all we are all uh, we are all both uh, we are all Asian style, right? But it's different. Even in China, uh, in China we have lots of different uh, architectural style, right? Uh, if we if you live in in Jiaxi, if you live in um, Anhui. There are totally, there are some different styles, right? I just can say that uh, Korea was influenced by China, but we developed our own architectural style within our uh, geographical and historical and climatic context. It's Thank such you. an, in <laughs> l let me jump in here and then I think we should move on to another question. Uh, but thinking about how you could ask the same question for people in Japan, where uh, culture essentially came from the Asian continent, from China via Korea, and you could call the buildings in Kyoto Chinese style in a sense, perhaps, um, pagodas, uh, but people don't think about it that way anymore. These are understood to have been indigenous. They're not purely indigenous, clearly. There's influence from the outside, but I don't think the, I don't think the rhetoric of the modern situation or the colonial situation that we're using here can easily apply to then, to, to, to that era. So it, it, it's almost impossible to have a discussion of the works of those eras in terms of the vocabulary of this panel. At least that would be my uh, reaction. Um, but I think there are other questions. So, so can you maybe move the <coughs> mic over and then the gentleman there, and then we'll go back. My name is Mong Ting Niu. I am from Harvard Graduate School of Education, and thank you all of you for your wonderful, illuminating, and very interesting presentations. A uh, question for Tant uh, is that um, you showed the example in your slide, Shuegun Temple, as well as uh, architecture built by British ruler, which is influenced by Western architecture. So when it comes to preservation, uh, do you see any difference from the reaction from the local communities or politicians or businessmen in terms of whether this is all um, or, uh, Buddhist slash Burmese, uh, doesn't have to be Buddhist, but it's a Burmese architecture versus um, British time built architecture, because I have seen in Bago, in Bagan, you know, you have many, many architect uh, architectures are being uh, restored and presented. And uh, so just wanted to see, hear a little more insight on this. And if I may ask quickly the second question to other panel, to um, uh, Chen and um, uh, this Hyun shop is that it seems to be that um, this is an effort to control the national narrative or shaping the national narrative uh, in terms of you know, after the Tiananmen Square, this is built by German, and also this is the removing the oppressor's memory, right? So um, have you found or seen a, an examples or other examples where it's a good compromise has been made where the architectures are being preserved and at the same time national narrative of whatever the government or political leaders try to maintain um, or the argument of economic development. So um, is there a good balance where the buildings are maintained but also at the same time the narrative had been shaped as the way uh, the ruling parties wanted to shape it. Thank you. 
Uh, I can simply give you an uh, answer of your question about the balance between the narrative and the preservation, you know, the ambivalence issue. Um, a very close case would be in Qingdao, another city, a coastal city in Shandong province, and they have done a better job in than, than the capital city of Shandong, Jinan, my hometown. I mean, Qingdao still has a, a quite, quite a lot of uh, German-style architecture, and they... Uh, you know the standard narrative hasn't changed much, uh, but the uh, the 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 the, the, the Qingdao government tries to strike a balance between you know the demolition and the uh, development and also preservation of colonial architecture. Yeah. Uh, maybe just to, uh, just to reply to that the second part of that question. I mean, I think a, a big problem in Myanmar today is that you know we have this very narrow nationalist narrative, ethno nationalist narrative that's kind of moved the country into a into a into a dead end. And thinking about you know a lot of the issues around conservation downtown and exploring the history of downtown is one way in which to kind of get out of that ed dead end to some extent. Because again, as I mentioned before, this is a landscape where you have not only so many different uh, minority peoples and, and faiths, uh, but you have it's 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 a it's a living museum of of so many different layers of of, of the country's history. Um, to your specific question, I think. The, um, you know, we had started with a narrow focus on the colonial era buildings just because that's what I saw and, and, and I was interested in doing something to protect them. But we quickly appreciated that there was a need to try to protect uh, the religious sites as well. None of the religious sites, certainly not the Shredigon Pagoda, was under any danger of demolition. And even other faiths, mosques and temples, were not in danger of being destroyed. But not being destroyed just meant not doing anything about them. And there was all, all kinds of other dangers. Uh, so for instance, Jain and Parsi temples, where there was very small communities of Jains and Parsis left, were just essentially abandoned to a large extent. Uh, and for the Shwedegon, as I mentioned, even though no one would destroy it, people were still thinking of building 40-story condominiums uh, all around it. So we had to think more broadly of, of, of what heritage protection could mean in, in the context of, of Yangon, and so we extended our efforts around those issues as well. There was a gentleman there uh, across the aisle. Now, Professor Chu, Professor Chu, Professor Liu, what's being done about the extent of Japanese heritage in Manchuria? When I was in Changchun, the big Japanese government buildings were all intact, being put to new uses, but in places like Shenyang and Dalian, there was much less. Is there any coherent policy toward this? And also, as a footnote, there's a, there's a Russian, not Soviet, Russian heritage in Harbin, which has to be dealt with too. What's be and down in that area. Um, I have never been to Harbin, but uh, I have very close friends who are from Harbin and also study architecture. And uh, um, they showed me some pictures of very well preserved uh, Russian architecture over there. Um, um, as I said, that uh, compared to all the other cities like uh, uh, Dalian and Harbin and uh, um, uh, those um, cities that used to be under Manchurian influence and also used to be um, occupied by Japan, Sh uh, Shandong province have really done a poor job in preserving our colonial architecture. There's a, okay, Krishna, and then gentleman here, and then there, and then that may just about wrap it up. Uh, Krishna Uk from the Association for Asian Studies. Um, my question is uh, whether the perception and attitude of the government vis-a-vis -vis these colonial structures is illustrated in, um, in texts that people use at university and school, because sometimes the teaching of architectural history does not simply superimpose the way you teach history. Um, I'm thinking of Cambodia, for example, where there's a deliberate and systematic attempt from the current government to, um, to destroy this building or to slowly smother them. Is there a, a comparison that can be made with Myanmar, Taiwan, China, or Korea? Because this is also a question with the, the, the way the younger generation perceive that. Thank you.
Yes, uh, I think it's very interesting about your question because in Taiwan, Taiwan used to be defined as a Chinese society. So, so the, in the textbook or in many books, uh, especially in, in the department architecture, we only have Chinese architecture course. We don't have other course. But nowadays, Taiwan has been defined as a multicultural society. Mm. So, so now we have different kinds of architecture history. And I, I think it helped to, for the younger generation to realize that in Taiwan, we have Aboriginal people's house. We have Dutch for fortification. Mm. Because Dutch people has been in Taiwan for many years. We have Spanish fort. We have Spanish, we even have a name, press named San Diego in Taiwan. And so we have Japanese period. So now, nowadays, when we teach in history of Taiwanese architecture, we include all these different ages, different part. Uh, so younger generation, they realize that from the original people to the present, they are all there. Heritage. Maybe just very brief. I mean, I think until the late uh, 2000s in, in Myanmar, there was a, a very tight nationalist narrative, right, which basically started with a, with a primate 40 million years ago that's indigenous to Myanmar. And then the, the general said there was an evolution of people in Myanmar uh, through the different kings. And then there was uh, just the interregnum of, of British rule and then the restoration of, of Burmese sovereignty. So the British period was seen as an, as an aberration and, and nothing to be valued in in any way. And I guess, you know, I think partly because of the, I think in, in, in the popular b belief, the military rule failed so completely, right, and, and became so unpopular by the end of it in the late 2000s that people were ready to think about almost anything else. And I think into that space, we were able to inject to some extent some ideas about valuing a sort of multicultural physical heritage. Uh, but we haven't won the battle yet. But I think because, again, that space was opened up, people were willing to listen in a way that they might not have been, say, 20 years before. Uh, as an additional comment to your textbook question, um, in the textbooks that I used in mainland China at, back at, at the university, Taiwan architecture was treated just uh, like uh, any vernacular architecture, Chinese vernacular architecture, uh, often associated with Fujian province, you know, get very uh, little details. It was not until two years ago when Professor Fu invited me to Taiwan that I learned that, oh wow, Taiwan architecture has such a diversity, such a long history. So it's interesting to pose these questions of how we learned architectural history through the textbooks, right? So thank you for your question. Interesting. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, neocolonialism and the uh, bizarre difficulties that uh, former colonial areas face, I want to bring up one example from uh, China, which you may, Professor, know something about. It's uh, Zanjiang, which came under the French for half a century. Now, it was a leasehold. That is to say, it was not like the other concessions. There were very few areas which were actually rented by the foreign powers from China. In the leasehold of Zanjiang, there was a really tremendous growth of interest in what went on during that half of century. And there have been a number of conferences there on the colonial period. They have translated a whole series of books written by uh, French scholars on that period into Chinese. And here's the curiosity. Uh, they are renovating some of the great old French buildings, but there is still ambivalence. But in one of the buildings, 
which was the French colonial administrator's office. They have recreated the office absolutely perfectly. They have a dummy of the French administrator sitting at his desk. There are French uniforms everywhere. There are medals. There are all kinds of things. Yet simultaneously, if you visit the museum, and there is one museum, a private museum, which is full of French artifacts, but on the main floor of the National Museum, the whole floor is dedicated to the heroic acts of the local people fighting the French occupation. And these two ways of viewing history exist side by side in an amazing and friendly way because the renovation is going on. There is a willingness to talk about the French not always agreeing with what they did because there's good reason not to think it was a good thing, but for historical and tourist reasons, they are for the first time taking the step to show the French at work in that former leasehold. You may have heard of uh, Zhang Zhang because to me it's a remarkable Can you uh, put it in the form case. of a question or is it, do you have a question for? Uh, pardon me? D d we, we need to move on. Do you have a question? The, 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 the question is, besides Shanghai, is there any other area in China where they are moving in the direction of actually recreating, in a positive way, if you will, the occupiers? Because, of course, even the Americans were there. There were the Japanese were there, the Germans were there, and uh, it's such a huge country. There may be other examples of this strange uh, companionship. As far as I know, um, I haven't heard uh, such cases, but uh, it's, that would be great if they they do. Um, things differently. So um, I'll let you know if I find out any example. <laughs> thank you. There's one, maybe the one final question back there. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you, panel. That was so interesting. I have a quick, simple question for Thant. Is the Yangon Heritage Trust, does it still enjoy influence with today's government? And do you think it will continue to do so if it does? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, it, it does in a way, in the sense that uh, the Yangon Heritage Trust receives more requests from the government, more requests now than ever from the government for assistance in terms of technical advice on the renovation of government-owned property. Uh, the chief minister of Yangon is a, is a supporter, an enthusiastic supporter, and he, uh, he's very open to ideas from the Yangon Heritage Trust. The problem is, you know, the problems that I mentioned, that it's very difficult to, for the government to take the ideas that, that we give them uh, and act on them for a whole variety of, of bureaucratic capacity, political reasons. Um, and so I, I think as an NGO on the outside, we can take the issue up to a point, but then it's up to the government to kind of see things forward in terms of new legislation, regulation, implementation of government policies, and that capacity is, is, is still very, very weak. So I think the influence is there, but I think you know the, the, the challenges are so immense. I'm not I'm not quite sure where we'll be in a in a couple of years. If I could just re actually just respond to that, I mean Burma is not part of China at least not yet. But um, I think <laughs> there, I mean there is there is some examples. I mean in, up in Maimyo in the old British Hill Station, the old government house was was rebuilt uh, not too long ago by a by a Burmese tycoon. Actually quite a good reproduction, and you have. You have these wax figures of all the, the the British governors, and then you have a Japanese soldier with a bayonet on the <laughs> on the side. Um, but a lot of it's interesting, even though it's a reproduction, a lot of Burmese won't stay there because they're afraid of English ghosts. Um, yeah. I haven't been there, but I understand the prison in Seoul, So Demong Prison, is it, is yeah. set up with um, wax replicas of the um, of, of torture. Yes. Uh, so there are Japanese officials and Korean victims um, displayed there, and sound effects too, is what I'm told. So there are all kinds of ways to sort of create an authentic, recreated 
uh, that's not architecture so much, but it's in a building that's, that's uh, with a prison. I visited the so-called Hanoi Hilton in um, Hanoi, the, 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 the Hualu prison, Hualo, Hualo prison in January. Hmm? And that was built by the French, and it was so interesting to see it presented up until 1945 as a site of brutally bad conditions in which the um, heroic resistors to the French were imprisoned. And then after, I mean, through 1954, and then after that, it was described in the next years as a time where of a very benevolent prison administration that re-educated people properly. So it was, it was a really uh, impressive and actually surprisingly rich pre uh, Yes. Uh, and markers of various cells. But <coughs> the idea was to commemorate the uh, martyrdom of all of these different these freedom fighters. Um, otherwise, it was going to be totally demolished uh, to make way for what is now the Hanoi House and Shopping Center, where you can buy Gucci bags and whatever you know, yeah. strike your fancy and Yes, well, I think this panel made clear that the economics of tourism are part of the story in, in every case, and it's ines inescapable. I mean, uh, we can't, we shouldn't just sort of say, oh, this is terrible, because this is the world we live in, but figuring out how, how to manage it is, I think, the challenge. But I want to thank the panelists for, for wonderful presentations. And thank all of you for terrific questions. You can continue the conversation outside. We have a reception uh, to which you're all cordially invited. Thank you Thanks very much. a lot. Yeah, yeah.